the BRICS is simply the, the front organization for a much bigger movement. And the movement, what, it, what it, it, gold, gold, the price of gold is very much uh, tied to these events and this, this split into these two blocks. And what has happened the, at the direction of the United States, the um, financial, global financial systems have been uh, weaponized, specifically SWIFT. Daryl Montgomery, good okay. afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I uh, we we were stalking each other. That's a bad word, but through LinkedIn, and I started getting familiar with your work, and you nailed some things. And uh, wanted to get some your opinion on that. Can you give me a thirty thousand foot view now on uh, the the economy? Why we're seeing so much or have seen so much inflation and why uh, really the gold price has just rocketed up. Okay, it's my contention. We are in um, an inflation era and there's very little that can be done to stop it at this time. And if you want to be particularly uh, negative, uh, we could call it the inflation doom loop. And at that point, the government has borrowed so much money that it cannot reduce, do anything to reduce inflation because the cost of debt service of paying the interest rates on the bonds is so high that eventually will absorb all tax receipts. So, or so much of them that the government has to continue to print more and more and more and more money. And this devalues the currency more and more and more. And then inflation goes up and up and up. And that process feeds on itself. And we've entered the beginning of that process. So there's a lot of implications to that. And one of the big implications is the bond market, which is, I think, key in holding this all together. Um, I would like your opinion on where are we at with the bond market? I've heard some, some people I've interviewed as well as some people I've interviewed that they wouldn't touch long-term yields, treasury yields with a 10-foot pole. Uh, others are of a different point of view. They see us going into deflation first. Do you have an opinion about that in the bond market? Well, obviously, my opinion is inflation. The interest rates are way, way too low, uh, and they they're manipulated by the central banks. And what happened, we've got a key piece of information. The Fed lowered rates 50 basis points. And instead of long-term rates going down, they have continually gone up since then. And so have like most other, even shorter long-term rates. Uh, so this indicates that it's shouting inflation. You know, if do Fed lowers rates even more, the long-term rates will go up even more. And that's inflationary itself. This is part of this doom loop scenario that the Fed, that the Fed's between a rock and a hard place. Doesn't matter what it does. Yeah. So I wouldn't go anywhere near in my, I've written four books about investing and, and the key is you short long-term bonds. You never own them. Right. I had Mark Faber on, it's been about a month ago. And he says his expectation, and I'm paraphrasing here, so please, please, everybody who's going to be watching this, be gracious and watch that video. He said he has an expectation of long-term rates to go to about 20%. That was his expectation. And I lost, not because I thought he was being funny or thought that was funny, but I thought that the consequence of that What's your comment about that? Do you see long-term rates going that high? There's, there's no limit to long-term rates. The question is, at what point in time? And, and you know, I've studied inflation for 2,000 years, <laughs> for a 2,000-year period. I'm not that old. And, and it's the same story over and over. And uh, there's ultimately no limit. We will eventually have hyperinflation. Now, that may be 50 years from now or 100 years from now or maybe 20 years from now. You know, we have to see how it plays out. But uh, th that the end point is known. It's just how, what path we use to get there and how long it takes. So 20% is certainly reasonable. Um, now, were these long-term bonds or short-term rates? Big was talking about. He was talking the long-term from what? 
Okay, because they got to 14% in the late 70s, 1980s. So in the United States, you know, uh, and the inflation rate peaked around 14% in the U.S. In, in Britain, it was 26%. And we have a lower inflation rate than we ordinarily would because we have the reserve currency of the world. Now, that is rapidly eroding. And once the dollar loses that reserve currency status, and once again, this is a several-year process that is already in motion, uh, our inflation rate will be a peak. It will be much higher than we're used to. So, you know, losing reserve currency status is very inflationary. And all you have to do is look and see what happened to Britain after it lost, the pound lost the reserve currency status. So this is our future 50 years, 70 years down the road. Comment more about that. How do you see that playing out as far as the reserve currency, us losing that status? And I want to say that the BRICS just met and... It's an assumption, but an assumption that they were going to discuss diversifying out of dollar base, the dollar and dollar base assets. My question, but yeah, comment about them more. And also a question is, from what I see and believe, the dollar is the only currency that can handle, if you would, all of those transactions. Is there another currency that can handle those, that's those sizable transactions between other countries, if you would, for lack of a better way to say it. Well, there are many people who claim no, and I agree they are correct. However, that is not the correct question. The question is, are, is there another basket of currencies or type of currencies that can be put together? We, we are looking backwards, like the world had one currency and it had another currency and then another currency. Technology has, has uh, made that irrelevant. I mean, we have cryptocurrencies and a lot of cryptocurrencies. Those challenge the dollar also. And it doesn't just have to be the Chinese yuan. It can be, a, the BRICS are talking about a basket of currency and gold. So uh, anything and no currency in the world is backed by gold right now. None of the fiat currencies. I mean, and technically the Russian rule is a, a little... But if they, uh, uh, any um, hard, hard asset backing will make any currency or group of currency, and it does not have to be one. The problem is people will hear, oh, what's this one magic currency? That is not what they should be looking for, because that's what it was like 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 200 years ago. Well, the world moves on and it has changed. The, the, the future is different. It's not one currency versus another. And when I say the dollar... Uh, in my theory, I have a theory called global bifurcation, meaning the world is splitting into two blocks, the collective West and the collective East. And we are in the collective West. That's the United States, Canada, Europe, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea. Everything else is the collective East. Now, the dollar will remain the reserve currency for that collective West block. It will lose that status in the collective East. And so there are going to be two sort of reserve currencies or a cur reserve currency and a basket of currencies or some other alternative. So, I mean, and this hasn't happened before, so people can't picture it. Got it. So, um, obviously, this has huge implications for gold. And just as to set this up, you, I did so a lot of research on you, and you had several videos from as far back as 2007, 2008, where you were discussing investing in gold. But, and it was a great call, but these have profound implications, what you just said about gold. Is that really, would you say in your opinion, related to the recent move, when I say recent in the past 12 to 18 months, move that we've had in gold, is it because of the bricks or is it just because of all of the money or uh, being printed or all of the above? Well, the, the, the BRICS is simply the, the front organization for a much bigger movement. And the movement, what, it, what it, it, gold, the price of gold is very much uh, tied to these events and this, this split into these two blocks. And what has happened the, at the direction of the United States, the um, financial, global financial systems have been uh, weaponized, specifically SWIFT, which is the bank messaging system for the world, and Euroclear, which is where uh, uh, 
a lot of assets in the greater European area are kept or, or go through. And you cannot weaponize, and, and weaponize, I mean, Russia was removed. Russian banks were removed from the SWIFT system and sanctions. Now, this is not the first time. The first time was in Iran in 2012. Now, that sent a message to China and Russia, one day you will be next. So Russia uh, developed its own alternative to SWIFT starting then called SPFS, and China developed an alternative to CHIPS, which is the actual transfer of money, and they call that SIPS. Then they got together once the uh, uh, Ukrainian-Russian conflict broke out and the sanctions happened against Russia, bank, Russian banks, and said, we want to combine these systems, give them to the BRICS, and, and, and you know, spread them through the collective East. They do not fall at the collective East, by the way. That's my term. They have their own name. So the BRICS is, is simply like the EU or some organizing function. It's not the whole picture. It's, it's part of a greater whole. So, and yes, this is causing, and since the systems are weaponized, you do not want to hold dollar assets. And so they are selling their dollar assets, uh, trying to get rid of them. And an easy place to park them is to buy gold. Because it's easy to take uh, um, money in an electronic form away from someone. Gold in a vault is much more difficult to uh, get a hold of. And, and what we did, part of this weaponization, the euro player holds the Russia central bank assets and, and the um, G7 EU, the UK, the US have tried to like steal those assets. Now, you know, this is sacred. This is like, you know, going into a church and, and you know, defiling it. To, you know, you cannot do this in a financial system. Once they operate on um, reliability and once that has been destroyed, the system will be finished. It's once again, it's just a question, how long does it take? Because something called disintermediation takes place. People take their money out. And this mm -hmm. is used for banks too. Like when you think a bank or the bank system failing, you get your cash out of the bank. Well, these, all these other collective peace countries are getting their money out of Euroclear and the Western financial systems. And that is making gold go up. That is, you know, my and other people have other interesting ideas on this, but it's, it seems very clear to me. Yeah, I would agree. It seems very clear to me as well. I think too, I guess where I'd like to ask you then is in your opinion, why all of this involvement over there, why all this U.S. involvement over there in the war with Ukraine? And it doesn't seem, it's hard for me to think about it just as we're concerned about, air quotes, Ukraine freedom. <laughs> But yeah, to comment about that, if you would, what are, what's in our interest then? Is it purely financial? Again, trying to, yeah, purely financial. Is it assets on the ground, meaning natural resources? Why is that happening? Okay, here's the controversial part of this discussion. The, the, uh, it's, it's assets and it's money, but it's not our assets or our money or anyone watching this video. Uh, it is my contention, and Ukraine is not the beginning. There was a 20-year war in Afghanistan, and, you know, why is not very clear. And we spent at least a trillion dollars on that war, probably a lot more. And all of the and we have one regional war after another, after another, after another. Right. These are all massive money laundering operations. And there's certain groups of elites and, and uh, uh, interests that make quite a bit of money. And politicians from the United States, from Europe, from Canada, from the UK, probably Australia, although I can't say that specific, uh, throughout the world make money off of this money laundering, either usually indirectly. I'm not saying they're getting a bag of cash at their, their office, but, you know, they get contributions, they get favors from their uh, constituent groups, business groups, they make money. So uh, this is why, you know, anyone who questions this, Say, wow, well, give a reason why we were in Afghanistan for 20 years. I mean, we went there to get uh, Saddam Hussein, not Saddam Hussein, sorry, um, um, the guy at the, um, I'm blanking. Yeah, was, I'm not, yeah. yeah I, everyone else does too. And when he was killed in 2011, so we went there an extra uh, 13 years. Right. We accomplished the goal. 
and he wasn't there anyway. He was in Pakistan. <laughs> right. So it doesn't matter that you know the reasons given, you know, are false, and that's proof that they're false. You right. know, we're just there to like have people run. Um, someone's making lots of money, and and the you the taxpayer is paying for this. As I said, we spent at least a trillion dollars in Afghanistan, and and Ukraine is another giant money laundering operation. And, you know, with the EU, the US, the UK, you know, heavily, heavily involved. And what are the rational reasons, you know, to claim Ukraine is a democracy is, is ludicrous. Yeah. No, you know, it's, I always found it almost humorous that you use humorous very, um, I want to say in the right way that you can make a big case we were attacked by Afghanistan, right? And then we go and into Iraq. I say that I just laugh me because how does that make any sense, right? So I would agree with your your thesis that this is money laundering. Does it have to do with assets though here specifically with Russia and Ukraine? Does it have to do with Natural resources specifically, do you think? Uh, there are claims to that. No, I don't think so. Russia is the most natural resource rich country on earth by far. It does not need any more natural resources. Now I'm sure it's willing to take them. And, and Ukraine's biggest natural resource is wheat. You know, it's agricultural productivity. It's one of the biggest wheat producers. But right. Russia is also one of the world's biggest wheat producers too, by the way. So uh, it does, I, that has nothing to do with it. There's a long, well, I mean, maybe it's uh, like 0.01% or something. So th there's a long history of um, going back to when the communism fell and uh, NATO, uh, the Secretary of State in the U.S. promised that NATO would not add any of the Eastern European countries, which we, and, and the president of France did this and Margaret Thatcher in England did this. So, and we violated all those promises and we added all the Eastern European countries we could get to NATO. And then we basically got, and there was an attempt to do it to Ukraine going back to at least 2016, 14, you know, it hasn't had, and Russia said, no, that's, that's it. Because we, uh, they did add Estonia, Latvia and, and Lithuania, which were part of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So, and Russia said, no, this is the red line. You may not cross this. And, and so we pushed and they pushed. And most people do not know between 2014 and the day the war broke out in February 2022, the EU sanctioned Russia 72 times before the war broke out. And then there's these sanction packages. And the first sanction package was the day before the war. And, and the claim was, oh, we're doing this to, you know, stop Russia. Well, it, they did it. That was uh, 72 times and it didn't work. And they keep doing it and it didn't work and didn't work. And what business could do something over years that doesn't work and stay in business? Nobody. And, and in fact, it's not destroyed the Russian economy. It's destroyed the German economy. Yeah. I mean, they relied on cheap and, and plentiful Russian energy in the form of natural gas and less, lesser oil, to a lesser extent. And they cut themselves off from it. So their economy is struggling horribly. Volkswagen just closed, sets closing plans, laying off workers. The chemical industry, which is, I think, the biggest industry in Germany, part of it's moving to the United States. So we don't mind that. We're happy. But it's just because they can't get cheap, reliable natural gas anymore. And, you know, the U.S. said, OK, we will sell you. Uh, liquid natural gas at four times the price you were paying Russia to get the pipeline gas. So we're happy. You know, we're getting money off of it, but it's destroying the German economy. Yes. It's interesting you brought up the German economy, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, the biggest economy in the EU. I was just reading over the last 72 hours just about how Germany is pretty much imploded even. And I'm not laughing because it's sad. It's very sad, but it just, it's exactly what you said. And it had to do with, um, their costs have risen almost exponentially. And then 
meaning their costs, and they're a huge, obviously they're a huge exporter of automobiles. And so their costs to make automobiles have grown exponentially, you know? So I think that's interesting. It's just all of these dominoes seem to be falling. How does this play out, um, if you would, between Russia and Ukraine and your best guess, or do you even want to comment about that? Oh, oh sure. Well, we'll see what it's, uh, well, it's, it's pretty obvious that Trump is going to win the election and he says he's going to uh, negotiate and he will certainly try to do this. My guess is that the EU will try to stop that, whatever the negotiation is, because they are interested in keeping the war going and they will think he was giving away too much of the store. So, and the Russians will be very hard negotiators. They'll say, we want this, 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 and that, and nothing, you know, go away. <laughs> so that's likely to fall apart. Uh, the front line is it collapsed in the last several weeks or even two, three months where the Russians are pushing ahead and gaining territory every day. So, so Ukraine could literally collapse in a short period of time. Once again, when that short period of time is, is, is not clear. It has no functioning economy. We, we in the EU, meaning we, the United States, fund the economy. If we pulled the money out, they wouldn't have anything. So how long does that go? You know, it's a losing. Even said from day one, well, whatever you look at, Russia has four times more than Ukraine. So you just do the arithmetic. Who is going to ultimately win the war? And then what has happened, you know, people, uh, we can go back to that right at that time. You know, people in uh, uh, politics told me, oh, Russia only has a $1 trillion GDP. It has no weapons manufacturing. It's just going to use the weapons that it has left over from the Cold War. Then it will run out in a couple of months. Then it will collapse. The whole war will disappear. And I said, none of that's true. And none of it was true. I mean, Russia, even the New York Times about six months ago published uh, Russia's production of shells, which is the most basic, the I don't mean in, in big guns, not, not small guns, is seven times all of NATO. And then other sources say, oh, no, it's only two or three times all of NATO. NATO is 30 countries and more than 30, includes the United States. So they have manufacturing. They are not out of weapons. They were supposed to run out of missiles in six weeks. You know, they every night they bomb Ukraine with missiles. So this and and the World Bank uh, recalculated Russia's economy. And I saw some published reviews of 5.4 trillion and even like uh, uh, verbal reports of 7 trillion GDP. And then notes saying, well, we can't analyze the, uh, um, there's a lot of hidden economy or black economy, black market economy. And maybe it's 10 trillion GDP. So Russia was much, a much, much bigger economic force than uh, uh, we admitted or knew. And, you know, the U.S. foreign policy makes this mistake constantly of underestimating and, you know, uh, the enemy. And then, of course, everything gets messed up. So and, and Germany is the biggest economy in the EU. Russia is now the biggest economy in Europe. Yeah. And exactly. that happened in the last year. Very that's interesting. After, that's after sanctions. Germany moved down a place. Russia moved up a place. It seems like all of these managers and people that are coming up with all of this policy, they've done such a bad job. And maybe that's the point. That's, that is the point. <laughs> Just let people be free, make their own decisions, and uh, usually the best decisions come out in front. Um, you know, or as it takes some time, it might take some time, but usually the best, not usually, the best decisions will always prevail. If they're free, free, um, if that makes sense. Tell me a little bit yeah. about this. Um, we've had a, a significant drop in the oil price, um, really since the start of this war, which is quite surprising. And what's also quite surprising to me is that oil has been significantly drawn down in price, even though I look at the, um, you know, just just the inventory reports that are exceptionally low and we have a war going on in the middle east 
what's going on with Doyle? Is this um, is this because of the election? Is this because of short term deflation ahead? Yeah, what's your opinion? Well, the real opinion is yes, it's because of the election. You know, I followed the oil market very closely and have for years and years and years. Oil is incredibly underpriced, incredibly underpriced. Now, uh, there's inc very high risk in the Mideast. It is not going away. You know, and I've seen a string of reports for months and months. Of, oh, peace is coming to the Middle East any day now. And this event happened. So, oh, things have gone down. And then some bigger incident takes place, right? <laughs> So, because it's not going to come, it might come temporarily. I mean, that is possible. But, you know, things are not settled down. So, this is a big risk to oil production. And secondly, the election is coming along. And if you remember, Joe Biden sold half of the U.S. strategic reserve to lower the price of oil because it was such a political hot potato. Now, I think it would be naive to think that the U.S. government or the U.K. and EU would not manipulate the price of oil down for political convenience. And they're not just doing it for the U.S. election. They're doing it to try to defund Russia. Keep in mind, the section, sanction programs, which, we just, which are now in 80-something sanctions, didn't work. So, and uh, Russia's largest uh, uh, amount of... Uh, Foreign income comes from oil. So if you want to defund Russia or Iran, which also it gets most of its money from, well, most of its money, it's a chunk of money in Russia. So that's how you defund your enemy. So, and if we could go back to, we're talking about silver and why does silver sell for 30 something dollars right now when the peak was $40 in 1980. And if you took, housing price inflation and adjust the price of silver to that, it would be over $200 right now, just based on inflation. Why is it selling for $32 or $33? <laughs> you know, this is not more, it's not a free market. <laughs> so answer that question for me. Why is silver selling for $32 to $33? And I've had other guests on the show and, and I paraphrase, they've have a thesis that the silver market is actually moving away from the COMEX and uh, the LME. It's moving to Shanghai. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I would break. One of my global bifurcation theory is that the East, and you know, the East is mostly Asia, Africa, Latin America. It's not technically East, it's right. Um, the, they will develop their own uh, trading uh, platform systems that are that they control, that are independent from the Western ones. And, you know, Shanghai is being built up. There's already a lot of financial life for decades in Singapore. You know, there was in Hong Kong. So, and, and there's a big metals. It's very different in Shanghai is you can actually get the metals and take them away or get them delivered. Here, it's paper. You know, the vast majority of trading is paper that turns into more paper. You don't actually go and get the silver and take it away. If if, if people tried to do that, there'd be no silver in like probably minutes or hours. <laughs> yeah. It's totally gone. <laughs> so, and if you look at uh, consumption of silver, global consumption the last two years, it would be way, uh, it's way, way higher than production. So in any basic economics says, well, you know, if the supply is too low and the demand is really high, price goes way up. And it has gone up a little in silver. But, you know, it's no way does it actually relate to like the real supply and demand. And there are big banks involved, you know, that uh, uh, control the market, <laughs> influence, influence the market strong. <laughs> So how does that play out? Tell me about, yeah, silver, how does that play out? How do you see that? Is that sooner than later we're going to see a massive price explosion or is it just going to be incremental as with what we've seen the last last couple of years, really? Well, silver always follows gold in price, not right. necessarily the next day. If you, you know, Once again, you don't know the time period. Gold has hit a series of all-time highs in the last six months. And I think it's at least two dozen and maybe more than two dozen, maybe three dozen. I 
read the number the other day. It's a large number. So gold keeps hitting higher highs, higher highs, higher. And silver's all-time high is $50. And it's still 30 something. So it has to get to its all-time high. And then, down, I think, maybe 10 days, it'll hit 50, it'll go down to about 40, get back to 50, break through, and then go to a much higher high. Now, this may take a couple of months or many months or a couple of years. We'll see. But you make more money investing. Usually, you make twice as much money investing in silver as you do in gold. So, yep. And do you prefer metal itself or do you prefer um, ETFs or do you prefer equities or do you have a mix of all of the above? Well, um, it depends on the person. I like, I invest in ETFs because they, they can be bought and sold. 10 times a day if you want to. Not that I recommend you do this, but um, people like holding physical metal, which you should put in your bank vault and not in your, under your bed. So, and, you know, gold, you can buy uh, quite an uh, uh, expensive amount. It doesn't weigh that much. <laughs> so, and Costco sells gold now. It's actually... Huge, there are huge profits in it for them. And I suspect, I don't have any inside information, they will eventually sell silver too because gold had just exploded. They never realized how how much demand there would be for it. <laughs> yes. Now, about all that, you've, um, again, just watching your videos, you're talking to in the New York Investment Club. And so you're, correct me if I'm wrong, you're up in the Northeast. So my question is, is are you seeing people that you talk to, where you speak, clubs that you present, investment clubs that you present to, are people becoming more aware of gold and silver as not only an investment, but a preserver, a preservation of wealth? I think there's always been a large community for that, for 50 years, 60 years, since, you know, Americans could not own gold until 1975. And silver, maybe a few, I think 62, something before that. So, you know, that's when the gold market began in the United States. Now, foreigners or anyone outside the United States could buy gold and they had, they've done so for thousands of years, basically. So, um, I think there's a, 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 a little more interest. I don't think it's really taken off. If you remember the late eighties and not everyone's old enough to, I mean, the early, the late seventies, uh, there was a frenzy for gold and silver buying <laughs> and that will happen again. We're nowhere near that right now. And that's like when you get toward the peak or, you know, at least a temporary peak of not a major, major peak. Yes. And one more thing, the, the gold silver ratio, which people can follow and it's low eighties right now, uh, it hit 16 in 1980 when both gold and silver peaked. And that is the ratio of gold and silver in the Earth's crust. So, and when uh, silver peaked at 50 in 2011, was only, that ratio was only at 30. So if you want to look well into the future, look for one day when that ratio becomes 16. And that will tell you that a big peak has happened. That may be year, decades from now, maybe years or decades from now. So. <laughs> Okay, well, Daryl, I think we're going to end on that. I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, you're a new person that I've had on the show. I think it's going to be received. If people want to know more about you, if they want to read more about you, how can they do all of the above? Well, if they want to know, they should connect with me on LinkedIn if they are on LinkedIn or follow me. You can do both. And then, you know, I have a series of books on uh, Amazon Kindle. So if you just put in uh, my name for the investing books, Daryl Montgomery, and the one I recommend everyone reads is uh, Inflation Smart, Profitable Investing When Money Devalues. It's the easiest read and it sort of sums everything up. Slightly out of date because it's written in 2013. The concepts are not out of date. There's some specific investments mentioned that don't exist anymore. And I've also found over time, which you may have found, when it says something like it had some ETFs, particularly where people can make, suddenly they can make a lot of money, those tend to disappear off the market. Yeah. All right. Well, Daryl, I'm going to link to everything in my show notes here, both on the YouTube channel and on the podcast. I want to thank you so much for your time. I had a great time. Thank you.
Thank you.